machine learning reading group. Um, today we'll be covering chapter five, which is decision theory. And um, we have um, Sati who's going to um, present the material for us. So go for it. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Pierre, for organizing this. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Los Angeles. It's only 9 a.m. I'll mute. Cool. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, share sound, optimize for video. Probably don't need all that. Tell me if you can see my screen, OK? Yes? Yes, we can see, you guys see my screen. Yeah, wonderful. OK. And also, I'm going to say a quick goodbye because I'm going to stop the video, and then it'll be just my voice from then on. Stop the okay. video. Cool. OK. So that way we can be a little less distracted and just watch. OK, so then as far as the talk itself is concerned, I have it right here. And after I finish the talk, I'll tell you where the link for that is. It is online, but right now I'm not going to do it online. Right now I'm going to do it from here. OK, so PML Chapter 5 Decision Theory. And what happens if you click on the link? Magically, all of Kevin's book shows up. And you do a speed tour, all met 900 pages. Here we go. Whee! OK, done. OK, not that fast. Or there's also a link just to Chapter 5. I took this out. And we'll be covering some selected topics from chapter five. We're not obsessively going to go through every page for sure. And we're also not going to go through each individual subsection because there's actually a lot in, the, in that chapter. So we'll not do that either. But instead, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Okay, so like this. We're first going to go through some basics of uh, probability uh, ending with base theorem. And so there's two topics in there, probably about five minutes each approximately. And then afterwards, Bayesian decision theories where we actually jump into chapter five and start picking out the 5.1, 5.2, you know, topics like that. So I've got six of those topics from uh, the first section, meaning 5.1, uh, such as posterior loss classifications. We're going to go through all this. And then this would be 5.2. So what does it mean to actually choose the right model? So in there, I'm gonna cover these four additional topics. So that is gonna be a total of 10 different things that I pulled out from chapter high. And the part that I'm leaving out is all about frequentist statistics because we're doing Bayesian based learning. And so frequentist, as you know, is the, the complementary you know, technique. And so even though the book mentions it, there's actually an asterisk that says it can be skipped you know, during the first reading of the book. And so today, since we won't have too much time I didn't feel the need to go through all of that anyway. So I'm not gonna do that. I will put up the chat here on the side just to see if somebody's saying something. I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, um, so I'm gonna make the screen a little bit narrower. And what else? Right, and then speaking of um, the book and everything, I just wanna quickly go through this link. In case you didn't realize, Kevin actually has a plan to you know publish like three books this first one, which he calls Book Zero, came out in 2012. It's almost like, I think, a 1,200-page book. It's like right there. And so um, that did not use Python. That's one of the main things. I think it used MATLAB, like here, MATLAB. And then the book that we're currently looking at, the one that's going to be out very soon, it is called Book One. And that is like the foundations that he rewrote, Book Zero. There's also a Book Two that is supposed to be advanced. So if you want to know where all the three books are, they're right here, probml.github.io. So this one, this one, and this one. There's not much in book two at all. And then here's what we're covering today, okay? The PDF file. In addition to all of that, there's also a whole bunch of Jupyter notebooks. These are actually very cool. So these cover more than actually what is in the current book. In fact, it's quite a laundry list of things. There's a lot here. And a subset of those are definitely from chapter five. In fact, from, you know, from the current book, book one. Um, as an example, you know, if you go to the letter D, for instance, you know, D theory, decision theory. So the, some of the code that is in here can actually help learn chapter five a little bit better. 
if there's time, I might click on it and then run like a few things, but maybe if not, you can definitely do it. So those are all um, Colab notebooks. And so that's very nice. Or if you have a local Jupyter, you can run it there as well. So I highly recommend that you look through those. There's a lot of neat things in there. Okay. So having gotten that out of the way, let's start talking about events and probability. So as you know, the whole thing is all about you know, different kinds of events that can happen in the world and how probable they are each event. And also are events independent or you know, are they somehow dependent or are two events dependent on a third event, for example, even though they themselves might you know, be independent from each other. So this solved the notion of things like um, you know, unconditional independence or you know, uh, conditional independence and so on. So I want to tell you the most basic thing for now, which is two events that are entirely independent. As an example, the event that it is raining outside and the event that I'm drinking a cup of coffee, for instance. So those could be A and B. They're independent when one does not influence the other in any way at all. So for example, if you know one of them, suppose you know it's raining, then that does not tell you anything about whether I'm drinking coffee or not. So it does not change the belief that we have about the other way. Huh? Uh, the, the occurrence of the other. So then when you have two independent events like that A and B, then the probability that they occur together A and B would be simply the product of the individual probabilities because it's not always raining. So it's gonna be a number less than one. And additionally, if you want me to also drink coffee, then I also don't drink, drink coffee a lot. So that's also a number of fraction less than one. So multiply those two fractions, the overall fraction is gonna be even smaller than either one of them. So that is simply what the probability of both of them occurring. Okay, so it is simply the product of the probability of them. Okay, so then this is what we get for two entirely independent events. But more to the point about our book and about Bayes' theorem and so on. This is notion of events being conditioned on each other. So there's an event conditioned on another event. Like for example, there's a COVID test, you know, conditioned on actual occurrence of COVID, you know, and even the other way around. So events can be like conditioned on each other, you know, forwards and backwards, like A conditioned on B, B conditioned on A. So suppose you want to find the probability of A given that B has occurred. So you write it. So probability A conditioned on B. This stands for conditioned on. Or you could even call it the conditional probability of A given B already happened. That is simply going to be the probability that they both happen together divided by the probability of B happening all by itself. Likewise, the complement, the converse, the symmetry, you can also have B conditioned on A. So this is backwards to that. So when you have B, when you want to know what the probability for B is, given that A already occurred, then it's the same A and B. I simply wrote it as B and A, but it's basically commutative. So same A and B occurring together, divided by the probability of A occurring all by itself. So this is actually very interesting right there. So A conditioned on B, B conditioned on A. In fact, this is exactly where base theorem is gonna come from because you can leave out this little part. You can simply just take out A, A and B and multiply this and then take B and A and multiply that. Then equate them to each other, which I'm gonna show you now. So for right now, just remember, these are two different things. A conditioned on B versus B conditioned on A. Okay, so the formula looks very symmetric. From there, we get this most important rule, Bayes rule, where you take the A conditioned on B, B conditioned on A, and they both involve A intersection B, right? They both involve A intersection B. Therefore, you can multiply this over here, you can multiply this over here, and equate them, which is exactly what is happening here. So A given B times probability of B equals B given that A occurred times probability of A. And there is the wonderful base theorem right there. So A and B are abstract. We definitely need to you know, understand this very well. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes giving you like a, an example and then a second example really fast. Just like a review and then we can move on to other topics. So this symmetric formula is of course the base formula. Usually one of them is divided. So it looks like there's only one term like here, like that. So that's usually how you see it. So the probability of A given B is the converse probability of B given A times PA divided by PB. But of course you can always multiply it back, all right? So this is a pillar of probability and statistics, it's everywhere. 
And so then the main thing that it does is it lets you invert this whole conditional probability. So if you know B conditioned on A and you know these other things, you can actually then turn around and make it A conditioned on B. So it seems pretty magical. It's wonderful. All right, so then you can go back and forth. No three terms and compute the fourth. All right, so rather than A and B, you might as well use words like hypothesis and evidence. So suppose it's a hypothesis about something happened. Okay, we've got something happening. And then there's actual concrete evidence, you know, that something might have happened. So then you call them H and E. Then here's exactly one way to understand basis formula, which is if you wonder if a certain hypothesis H caused that event E. So event E happened on account of that hypothesis. So for example, say you had COVID tests coming out positive, then the, the hypothesis might be, wow, I have I probably have COVID. So then you want to know, did COVID actually cause the test to come out positive, or maybe it was possibly a false positive. For that, here's what you do. You then take the evidence conditioned on the hypothesis. So it's the flipping of that, times the probability for the hypothesis itself, the probability of COVID. So we call this the prior probability. And this, by the way, is posterior. So base always goes from prior to posterior. Okay, so then, and then this, this complement, um, probably we call it likelihood. So likelihood times prior divided by, for that same event, such as my COVID test coming out positive, there could be other hypotheses as well. So then you basically add up all those hypotheses. In fact, you multiply them. You multiply each hypothesis uh, probability times the event um, happening under that hypothesis, meaning take the same numerator, and do it in the denominator, but many times one for each hypothesis. I'm going to show you a better example. So the whole idea is that this becomes like a fraction where the same numerator also occurs on the denominator and denominator has more other terms as well. So then that fraction is the fraction for this event happening under that hypothesis. Suppose there was another hypothesis, then you would have that similar right now, say H prime, then H prime is going to show up, but the same denominator Therefore, the idea would be if you add all of these up, it's going to add to one. So therefore, what this very cool formula lets you do is it takes you, it lets you take um, a sampling prior of hypothesis that add up to one and conditioned on an event, give you a posterior probability distribution that also adds up to one. That is because of this weighted average that I told you. So the bottom is, it looks like a weighted average. And then, so you have a fraction of our hypothesis each generating evidence Z, but then other hypotheses also for the same event could generate their own fractions. And so they'll add up as well. So this is what I just said, a prior distribution of H that sums to one, it's converted to a posterior distribution that also sums to one under any event E. And of course there can be all kinds of other events. Say for COVID testing, there can be the PCR test, there can be all kinds of other tests. So then for each one of those events, this exact same thing can happen. Your prior distribution can become a posterior distribution. This sums to one, this also sums to one. So that's, I found a very interesting way to understand basis theorem. Okay, so then our book gives us this example. To go to chapter two, the univariate models probability chapter. It's about COVID-19. So the likelihood, so this this likelihood they give you, which is the true positive rate. In other words, say you test positive, then what does that actually mean? So that means the test is 87%, 87.5% accurate. So positive, 87% uh, of the time, a positive test actually would mean that you have COVID. Likewise, if the test comes out to be negative, what does that mean? Does it mean you don't have COVID? It's not 100%, it's 97.5%. So that is a true negative rate. So we got, we're given two things just from the real world based on how accurate the test is. True positive rate, that fraction, and true negative rate, that fraction. And those fractions, of course, don't have to add up to one. Okay, it depends on the test, it depends on other worldly conditions. So likewise, prior is what about the probability of COVID occurring all by itself? No test, nothing. What can you tell about that? You can say that 10% of the population is infected with COVID-19. So the prior probability of COVID-19 occurring is 0 0.1. You call it the prevalence, 0 0.1. And so then the prior probability of it absent is 0 0.9. That means if you don't do any testing at all, then out of 100 people, 10 people most likely have COVID, the other 90 do not. Okay, cool. So we take these, 
and then turn them into a small little table like this. This likelihood function is what the table is called. So the true positive rate return right there. So we call it sensitivity by 0 0.875. If we subtract in this row one minus that, then we get the complement of that, which is 0 0.1 to 5. We call it the false negative rate, those opposites, right? True positive, false negative. So that means for this number of people, even though they might have a, a had COVID, the test comes out to be negative, so we call it false negative. And that's a bad thing to have COVID. On the other hand, here the true negative, which is good, so all these people don't have COVID. But then for these people, which is subtract from one, you get that value. For them, the test will actually tell you that they have COVID, even though they don't. So you call it a false positive, a little false alarm, false alarm rate, that is 0 0.025. So these two numbers add up to one, these two numbers also add up to one. Later on, we'll see, we can do something with columns as well, okay? So currently, rows just add up to one. Okay, so we got these four values, and now we can start to calculate the probability that if somebody actually tests positive, then what is the chance that they have COVID? So then here's where the base formula comes in. So then the hypothesis is I have COVID. And then the test is it came out positive. That is going to be equal to flip it, which is the event that the test came out positive if you have COVID. That's the true positivity rate, 0 0.875 times the prior probability of somebody having COVID, 0 0.1, divided by, so now come the alternates, okay? So again, the 0 0.875, this is repeated, but you also have to repeat it for the complement, the this complement rather. Then you say 0 0.025 times 90% that you do not have COVID. So that works out to be 79.5. And so then that means 79.5% 79 79 chance that if you get a positive COVID test, it means you actually have COVID. So then I talked about the same event applying to other hypotheses. So the event is again, us testing positive. So the other hypothesis is I don't have COVID. So what is the chance of that? You can simply subtract that from 100. So 100 minus 79.5, but just to make it obvious, I wanna show that it's the same denominator, but now rather than that numerator, you have the complementary numerator. So if you work this out, it comes out to be 20.5. So that adds up to one, right? So that means the probability of having COVID or not having COVID under the event that you took a test uh, adds up to 100, 79.5%. 20.4%. So what about the opposite? Suppose somebody tests negative, then the question is, would they have COVID or not? Then for that, so it is this hypothesis, right? Again, you have COVID, but now the event is the test came out to be negative. And so then you flip it. So event is negative hypothesis. And then now that hypothesis that you do have COVID, which is 10% still. And so then this 0 0.1 to 5 comes to us because that is also something that we subtract. So from here, you subtract that. And then you multiply that out, then we get uh, that, and that is 0 0.014. That means there's only 1.4% that you're infected. So thankfully, right, because the test is negative, so most people that test negative don't have COVID. But then there's the little chance that you do. And what about all the others? So, you know, how many, what fraction does not have COVID? Again, 100 minus that, which is 98.6. Again, just to make it obvious, I have the same denominator, but now rather than that fraction, we use the other fraction. So again, in all these fractions, this is called likelihood, okay? So then you had one likelihood, now you have the other likelihood. So then those fractions add up to uh, one as well. That means under a negative test, um, we don't have 98.6% um, of the people having COVID and only 1.4% having a, a false negative. Therefore, they do have COVID. Cool. Okay, so then therefore, I wanna finish it all by saying this. You have a prior hypothesis, 0.1 plus 0.9, that sums to one simply prior no for COVID versus no COVID. But now you have a posterior two different ways, testing positive event, testing negative event. If you test positive, then the posterior breaks up into 0 0.795 for yes, and then 20.5 for no. So that means you cannot just think that only 10% of the population has it. If somebody tells you they got a test positive, now you're likely to think that you're 80% sure that they you know, actually have a COVID and it's coming from here. Likewise, for the complement that we just now worked out. If the event is testing negative, then the posterior distribution becomes that plus that. So you can add up to one in three different ways. So this is purely prior. This is posterior event E1. This is posterior event E2. Cool. So keep this in mind. And then the book also mentions the nice Monty Hall game. You have three doors and the car is behind one of the doors and I guess, right? All right, so then imagine that in the situation we guessed initially, we told now the host that the car is behind uh, door one, okay? Then what does the host do? 
the host goes and opens door three. Obviously, they're not going to open door one, they'll open door three. So that means two is now closed and one is obviously still closed. So then they'll ask you, do you want to keep your one or do you want to switch to two? And how would you decide? Again, if you just work it out, it's the exact same thing like what we did here, which is before that you had no idea where the car was. So the priors are all even. This happens in machine learning a lot. When we choose from different models, different probability distributions, we don't really know if one is inherently better than the other. So we end up making all the priors just evenly split. So likewise here, the car could be anywhere. But then now, because they opened D3, you know that the car is not behind door three. So then the chance that the car could be behind door two should basically double really. And so your chances still were there. So therefore compared to not switching, switching is actually a good thing. You know, you're twice as likely to win the car. So you should switch. Therefore, once again, the prior probability was one third, one third, one third. The posterior, given the door opening, D3 opening event is one third, two third, zero, also adds up to one. Very cool. So therefore, base formula can be summed up like this. The probability that our hypothesis under a certain event is simply the probability of the event happening under our hypothesis, which we call the likelihood, times the prior for our hypothesis, divided by this exact same weighted combination of the event under all the hypotheses. So what that does is make our hypothesis a fraction. Likewise, other hypotheses, they could all be fractions as well, they'll all add up to one. So then we call this posterior equal to likelihood times prior divided by marginal likelihood. So there's kind of a summation where you add up all these weighted uh, values. You call it a marginal uh, addition because it's almost like you had a notebook and you make the addition in the margin of the notebook. So we call it marginal. Usually in English, marginal means like not important and all it's inconsequential. But here marginal means total sum. It is the weighted, weighted uh, you know, sum of um, all the events, no, sorry, all the hypotheses under our event. Okay, so posterior therefore is likelihood times prior over marginal likelihood. And so then what actually happens is these unweighted priors, they provide the weighting. So each prior becomes a weight, each prior becomes a weight for an event. And then in the end, what you get is a weighted posterior. So unweighted priors sum to one, and now weighted posteriors also sum to one. Well, and so then in, in all of the book pretty much, chapter after chapter after chapter, what we keep computing are these marginal likelihoods, which is also called evidence, by the way. So we can just replace this whole word by evidence. So likelihood times prior over evidence, evidence that, you know, that event happened, uh, summing together all the hypotheses. All right, so you compute that, or sometimes you compute the, the posterior distribution or even a single posterior value. And why do you do that? Because that is what we're used to select. You always select from a bunch of actions you can take or a bunch of labels, for example, say in machine learning, maybe a decision tree, or a bunch of regression value parameters, maybe for linear regression, be slope and y-intercept, or maybe even you have a bunch of probability distributions, you wanna pick the best one, or you're selecting between a bunch of hypotheses, it's actually very cool, uh, usually between A and B, two hypotheses, or you even have like a complex you know, model, you have a series of complex models, you wanna evaluate like what is the best model I should pick for my data, you can do all of those using these marginal likelihood calculations or posterior calculations. So this is obviously heavily used in machine learning, but also in standard scientific research, you, know, you can use it for you know, hypothesis testing. And I'll show you an example when we get there. Okay. So then continuing on with the book, the book talks about this loss matrix. So now you have a way to estimate you know, if somebody has COVID or not, well, we went through this example. Then knowing that, how can you take this, this table that you can make, this little table that you can make with all the four possibilities and pair that with young people and old people. And then the fact that that test came out negative and positive. And then choose between one of two different actions. You either do nothing, especially when the person has COVID, you do nothing, or you give them drugs. So we start by saying there are four different states possible, these combinations of COVID, no COVID. And then you assign a cost of doing nothing. Obviously, when you have no COVID, there's no cost, just leave them alone. When you do have COVID, a young person has a cost that's much higher than an old person because a young person has a long time to live. So you should you know, penalize like not doing anything. So you should make it quite costly that they have COVID, you gotta fix it. Hopefully give them drugs. An old person, you know, they're, they're on the way to 
you know, they're going to leave the world soon. So it, their cost is not that high. The cost is measured in what's called quality. You know, it's also in the book. So a young person has a high quality, old person has a little lower cost. And the cost of administering drugs is the same for everybody. Initially, the cost is eight, okay? So then this is called the loss matrix. So loss matrix, and then this, this no COVID, yes COVID, we can turn that into numbers like we saw before. Then for every single row, like for all the four possibilities, you can compute what is called an optimal policy. Like what should I do? You turn them into Boolean zeros and ones. Like give drug, give drug, no give drug, give drug. How do you do that? So what you do is this, you pretty much look at the cost of not doing anything and compare that with the cost of doing something. And then if this cost is higher than that cost, that's when you act, okay? So it looks like this. So then this is the risk. You, you take these values and then you, you know, compute this, this risk um, value per row and then use that risk value, just like a cost to see whether you should act or not. So I'm gonna skip this part and show you this right here. So then you have again, test negative, test positive, young person, old person, young old. And so this, these are the values that came from the true positive, true negative rates that we went through. And the cost of no op is again, these are the values and the cost of drugs. So if you look at this, in all of those, these are smaller, no op is smaller, no op is smaller, no op is smaller, no op is much bigger. So then for a young person that tests positive, the cost of doing nothing is bigger than the cost of doing something. So you choose them for administering a drug. That's pretty cool. If you look at the notebook, and I'll just show you the notebook and I will not run it. This runs here, that notebook. I also have it in my collab, you know, so like right there. You can go and modify those values. There's actually a function call, actually three function calls. In those function calls, you can put in other values. Instead of the drug being $8, you can make it $5, for instance. So then if you do that, what will happen? If you change the value, it's something different. For example, you can even make the sensitivity for our, you know true positives go up. Now the test is much more sensitive. Or you can make the drug cost be lower. Like say you make the drug cost be $5 right now, then they'll all become five. So then the 7.95 is more than five, meaning even for an old person, the cost of doing nothing is too much. So you give the old person drugs as well. So please go in the notebook and make these changes, like change the sensitivity and or change the cost of the drug and see this formula change, okay? So I don't have time, I won't do it. Go live, just run it. Just go to run all, then it's just gonna run. Neat. So then this is all about acting. So you go from belief about somebody having COVID and not having COVID, to actually doing something about it. So it helps you do that. What about classification? So when you classify something, this is all about picking a class label, a Boolean a binary label can be zero or one, or you're trying to find out if it's something of one or five different kinds of birds, then you have five different labels to pick from. Or sometimes it's a label that says, I don't know, because I'm not sure. That could be a label as well. I don't know, don't care label. And you want to pick it optimally. So then how do you do that? Using our base formula. Here are three examples the book gives you. First is a zero one loss uh, example. And then there's also a classification problem. But now these values are not just zero or one for classification, misclassification. There's actually numbers for especially the misclassification. So we'll get to that in a minute. And then also what if you add a cost, you know, for saying like, I don't really know. The first example is very simple, zero one loss. So this means just simply for every actual classification, it's uh, there's no loss, so the loss is zero. For every misclassification of any label, the, the loss is one. So you simply add up all the uh, losses, you know, for, for classifications and misclassifications. So you call that zero one loss. So when you do that, zero one loss is a very cool loss function, right? It is like this. So this means the identical, you know, if this is equal, uh, if this is true, then that gives you a one. Whereas if this is false, that gives you a zero. So when it is true, you get a one because that's a misclassification. So you get a misclassification, it's one, otherwise everything is zero, which is basically the same as this. So then the loss is pretty simple, just simply minimize the expected loss. So the most probable label is the one that minimizes the expected loss. So you pick the most probable label, it's pretty simple. And this is the most probable, just say org max for that. And so then you also call it the maximum opposite map, map estimate for that. It's very simple, zero to one loss. So now you can make it a little bit more complex when you say these values for actual classification, correct classification, remain zero, the, the cost. But what about for the non-classification? Maybe they're not one. Maybe they're actually a factor of each other. Maybe one of them is two times the other. That's what this example is. So we start by having four values and then the actual P0 and P1 are probabilities 
for the two labels would come here, okay? So binary classification. So we're gonna classify either as label zero or label one. They show up here, we can multiply that, multiply that. This is exactly what this is. Say L00P0 zero, 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 plus L10P1. And then on the right-hand side, again, uh, P0, L01 plus P1, L11, like matrix multiplication. So then supposing P0 is the probability, you know, that what you pick the zero, and then one minus that is the other probability. So then when will you actually choose the label zero if this is less than that? Meaning, if, if so, to make it more specific, suppose these are zero, then they, they just go away. And then everything is now a, fu a function of just L01 and L10. But because of this, those are related as well. So if you then simplify it, you can make everything to be like this. You can just say L10 is C times L01. So everything is now in functions of uh, C. So then the L01 term just drops out. And so our decision rule becomes very simple. If P1 is simply less than one over one plus C, then you pick zero, otherwise you pick one. For example, suppose you make false negative be twice as much as false positive, because you know you don't like false negative, so it's dangerous. And so then uh, you make C to be two. And so then that becomes one over one third. So that one third number then becomes like a decision threshold. It means that if P1 is less than one third, then you pick a zero label, otherwise you pick a one label. So that's very neat that you can do it like that, that extra cost value of KC. This still does not have an I don't know option, meaning what if you're not sure of your options? You know, what if you don't want to pick any labels at all? Then there should be a way to do that. And you make your loss function a little bit more you know, intricate. You do it like this. You say the loss is zero if you properly classify. The loss is zero if you improperly classify. But also additionally, if you have want to do nothing, then you call it an action A equal to zero. And then you have a cost for that. So these are numerical values, you know, the lambda R and lambda E. And then there's an exercise that says the optimal action that you should pick is the most probable class, the highest class, the highest value for the probability has a value below this very interesting value. Meaning I send numerical values for all of these find this, and then go and compute probabilities for all the labels. Take the highest probability, see if it is less than this value. If it is, then pick that highest probability no label. Otherwise, pick reject. That's what this is. Okay. So then you pick the Y star label if the P star is more, otherwise reject. Cool. So then these are the things that I just now went through. There's your lambda star. And so maybe you can do the exercise afterwards and see what this out. This can be also plotted like this. So then this region for rejecting shows up like here. So in the horizontal axis, anytime the value is in here, it's called a reject region. So otherwise you accept and then you call it label one. Here you can accept, call it label two. So here the labels are one or two. So in this value, that value, you can actually label them. Otherwise here you say, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. Therefore I'm not gonna label it, it's just reject value. Cool. ROC. So then now, this is not like a new classification scheme, but more like what can you do with the whole true positive, true negative, all those values. You can compute these very interesting curves. And then the curves will tell you once again, how good your model is. So one of those curves is called ROC curve. The other curve is called precision recall curve. So we'll go through them one after the other. So when you have this confusion matrix, so this matrix that we had is called a confusion matrix where you lay all the four values out. Uh, actually I had it before. So these values, so if you lay them all out, that's the confusion matrix. So when you take the confusion matrix, and then we're gonna give names to all those four terms, like true positive, and then the opposite of that, and then the complement of that is true negative, and then one minus those is false negative, false positive. We saw that before. Then you can find out those, and then it, so in there you subtract from the true positive one minus and get the horizontal or the value for the row. Likewise, you can also subtract vertically. So you're gonna get four values horizontally, meaning the confusion matrix four values, confusion matrix four other values, so eight normalized values. We're gonna do that pretty soon. And then use those to plot the ROC curve and also the precision recall curve. Okay, so first of all, here's the definition for the confusion matrix right there. So when you have a threshold, you can always make the confusion matrix a bit dependent on that. So then for the threshold, you can see how many false positives you get. And then out of n, you know, labels. Then you uh, find also the true negative. So once again, just like we showed it here, false positive is here, 
and then two negatives here. So add those up, then the row sum is n. Those are the negative values because it's two negative. These are also negatives, but they turned out to be false positives. So they're all like how many negative values we got. Likewise here, how many positive values we got because these are actually positive. These are positive as well, but then falsely they came out to be negative. So we call them false negatives. So these sum up to P and then these sum up to N. Okay. And then the columns actually, you know, the things that you really get, the, the actual values that you got, add them up. So and then those are N prime, you know, N, N hat, P hat. So that's the confusion matrix right there. Likewise, you can also add things vertically. So we'll get to that next. But in the meanwhile, so when you add them horizontally, then this is exactly what we just now got. So then the true positivity rate, then suppose you call something called the true positivity rate. It is gonna be true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. So you go this way. Likewise, you can also have a false positive rate that is gonna be Ha <laughs> okay, cool, so now we can continue. All right, so we can also normalize vertically, so we can take our true positivity value and then subtract you know, one minus the value to get this value, but now you call them something different. So then you call them like this, you call it um, false discovery rate. And then this one is negative, uh, negative predictive value. And then this one is false omission rate. But just for now, just know that, you know, you're normalizing things column wise, okay, vertically. All right. So then what do we do with all this? So now you have these eight values. So these first four values, and then the, these four values, these four values. It turns out that we can actually plot them against each other. For instance, suppose you plot the false positivity rate versus the true positivity rate. And also you get a curve because of this tau value. So everything is still conditioned on this free parameter called tau. So you can vary them. And so as you vary them, you get different points you know, on these curves. And also imagine these are two different you know, um, algorithms we're evaluating for classification. We don't know what they are, it doesn't matter. Just tell yourself that for one algorithm, we got this curve in red. The other algorithm gave us this curve in blue. So then the question is, which of these should we pick? So which is like a better you know, model for our data? And so then the answer is this. The answer would be the curve that is pretty close to the top left. It's okay, thanks, Peter. Right, so then in this case, the curve A uh, is gonna be a better model than curve B. Another way of saying that is look at the area under the curve, which is called AUC. So AUC for B, which is a blue curve, is smaller than the AUC for A. That tells you that A is like a, a better model than B. And there's another measure as well, which I'll show in a minute. But first of all, those curves are called um, ROC. This actually comes from World War II, believe it or not. Receiver operating characteristic. So they're talking about radar receivers. So you can go read like where this idea came from. Okay, so then you plot FPR versus TPR, and you get those two curves. And just looking at the, the curve tells you uh, A is better than B because I just said the curve that is veering more towards the top left is better curve. So A is a better curve. So then likewise, you can also turn those into numerical estimates. So the whole curve can be simplified into actually two numerical estimates. One of them is the area under the curve. So the larger the area, uh, a better it is. So again, the red one has a higher AUC area under a curve. The next is called the equal error rate. The equal error rate is a value that you measure from the top. So then the lower EER is a better model. And so again, red is a better model than blue. So to find out what the ER is for red and blue, those are the values that A and B, by the way. What you do is you draw this 45 degree line. And that is because, uh, well, actually I'll let you, in fact, maybe I'll ask you in the discussion why that is. It is related to two positive rate and what you can drive from it, okay? It's basically the complement of that. So it turns out you can draw this line that joins you know, that, that, the diagonal. And then where that diagonal straight line intersects both our curves is the EER. So this is the EER for A, this is the EER for B. Once again, that tells you EER for A is better. And so A is a better model. So everything tells you A is a better model. Cool. 
Okay. So then this is what I just now told you. So uh, the, qual the quality of the ROC curve is just simply AUC and then also the equal error rate. Okay, this is the reason why you can draw the 45 degree line with the negative slope. False negative rate is one minus true positive rate. And so then at this equal error rate, the false negative and true positive errors meet. That's why it's called the equal error right there. Equal error rate EER. It's called the crossover rate. You can measure that simply with the diagonal line. All right. And so then there's one more measure that I want to interest you in. It's very cool. False discovery rate. There's a whole article in it. And there's a very cool procedure for estimating FDR. And then that was published in 95 by these two authors, Benjamini and Hoshberg. It's actually called the BH procedure. So the BH procedure is like a pretty well known one. There's even BH calculators on the web for the whole FDR. So this is all very important, obviously, when you do medical tests about you know, what is false positive, false negative. And so then this one is in the public health site. Okay, so then this is all about one kind of a curve you can plot called the ROC. What else can you do with all of this? Specifically, what can you do with these four quantities? You can plot uh, precision versus recall. So you can plot this versus that, and then you get a different curve. So this is now the recall in the y-axis for ROC. That is gonna become recall x-axis when I show you the precision recall curves. So in PR, what used to be in the y is now x, and then precision is the other value that I just pointed out to you. So what does this do? Um, so then the notion of what is a negative value is not all pretty well known. In other words, not all, you know, even say equally distributed in terms of positive or negative. So then when you don't know exactly if the, like how, how many true negatives you have, suppose the value is pretty small compared to true positives because you're looking for rare things and there are not many of those. Then you uh, would should not use the ROC, you would rather use a precision recall curve. So in this curve, it's more like, this is again, precision, the definition was in the previous slide. And then likewise, the recall we already looked at. But then now you can plot them against each other, like this. So now it's almost like a mirror image, you know, look rough, roughly like compared to the other curve. So in this curve, anything that veers more toward the top right is a better model. So it is the same uh, hypothetical examples we used in the previous uh, ROC. And therefore, once again, we expect A to be better than B. Okay. But for what it's worth, it's a different way to evaluate, you know, which is a better model. So then this can also be summarized as a scale error, but not in terms of equal error, not in terms of error under the curve, but more like precision at K. So I'm going to skip this, okay, just in the interest of time. But what it is, is there's two different scores, actually. So there's a map score and also a precision at K score. So either one of those can be used to characterize uh, PR curves. So you don't need the whole curve. They just become like a single numerical value. Okay, and then there's also one very interesting point, which is you can also um, compute this quantity called an F score. So this F score has an additional free parameter called beta. All the other parameters you already know from your model, okay? Okay, but from your data rather, I'm sorry. So then you have this extra parameter B, and then specifically when you said B to one, you get something very interesting. This looks like a harmonic mean actually. So one over this is no one over this plus one over this divided by two. It's like a harmonic mean of precision recall. Then you think, you know, why is that formula like that? And the answer for that is, it's all about this whole prevalence of different means of value. In other words, the prevalence, you know, PY1 is 10 raised negative four. And so then you don't want to take a very small value like 10 raised negative four and average that with a much larger value like one, because you're going to get like a wrong answer. And so the harmonic mean actually for small values gives you also a small value, you know, for the average. So when you average a small value and a larger value, harmonic mean is a better formula compared to an actual simple arithmetic mean. So we use that. Therefore, this score, F1 score, uh, is also able to, you know, look away the precision recall equally if you want. You're just using uh, beta and equal to one, or if you want more recall, see that's exactly what the purpose of beta is. You can make recall or precision be more important than beta. If you want recall to be more important, then increase beta to be more than one, make it to be two or even more than two. Likewise, if you want higher precision, then lower beta from 0 0.1, make it 0 0.5 for instance. Cool. And then one more feature to point out is ROC curves versus PR curves. Again, this notion of class you know, uh, imbalance, so it's about how many fractions of positives do you actually have. If you do this, then you have you know, P plus P over N. 
And so then you could do a ratio R of positive versus negatives, how many actual positives, how many negatives, then you get that in terms of pi, this, this value called R. ROC curves will not change if R changes, if the fractions of positive and negative change, ROC curve will not change. On the other hand, position will actually change when the fraction changes, when R changes. That is because you can rewrite position in terms of R. Again, I'll let you work this formula out, but there it is. So this one has a dependence, depends on, sorry, dependence on R, whereas ROC does not. Okay, so different things you're able to do with you know these quantities. Again, you have the same F beta formula right there in terms of R. So the point is that class imbalance does not affect ROC curves, but class imbalance will affect PR curves. Well, so, so far, I'm gonna show you my table of contents. We've looked at, again, action, you know, do you wanna give somebody the COVID-19 drug or not? Then we looked at labels, the classification part. Then we looked at two kinds of curves you can plot for estimating model quality. So next we look at regression. So now what happens is you actually are trying to estimate, you know, like what, what, what are the best regression parameters? You no, know, given some data. So for that, we typically use these loss functions. So these are classic machine learning loss functions. And um, so regression again, you know, in terms of 2D, suppose you're given a whole bunch of X, Y pairs, then what you learn is of course the slope on the Y-intercept, Y equal to NIMX plus C, but these can happen in multiple dimensions as well, obviously. Then you have multilinear regression, non-linear regression, all kinds of regressions. But the idea is to learn like all those coefficients, slope values, Y-intercept. So for that, you need good loss functions that can, you know, penalize the like, incorrect values uh, as opposed to expected values. So one of the penalty functions is classic L2 loss. This is a quadratic loss, as you can see, because it's a squared value. Uh, you probably already know this. So this one is also called the minimum mean squared error loss, MMSE. But sometimes a quadratic, you know, is too much, especially for outliers, you know, then say, so you don't really want to, you know, deal with outliers. Then you want to use a different kind of a loss called an N1, L1 loss where the loss is just simply the difference between the actual value, predictive value, and then with the mod so that the negative values disappear. But then the square term is not there. So specifically, it looks like that. This one is called L1 loss. See L1 versus L2 loss. There's also a third kind of loss called the Huber loss. That is somewhat of an in between both of those because Huber loss has an extra parameter. In fact, the parameter is actually just simply uh, delta. And so then by setting delta to different widths, you're able to you know tune this loss to be either to be like L1 or to be like L2. And in the meanwhile, R is just simply that same difference that we saw here, the absolute error. And so then this one is delta times R and then minus delta squared over two, say delta can do 1.5 for instance. So if that happens, then um, for, for if, if this R that you calculate, sorry, this R that you calculate is more than some delta that you set, then this should be the loss. Otherwise that should be the loss. See, looks that looks more like the quadratic loss. And so this is gonna be uh, that one last. Yeah, so right, Michael and Douglas, I'm going to give you the link at the end, you know, so that basically may force you to focus if that's okay with you. Yes, this is online for sure. All right, so Huber loss can pretend to be L2 loss or it can pretend to be L1 loss. And you can actually see that by plotting them right here. So this is in the book as well. So L2 is your typical quadratic. And then this one is L1. You can see there's a slope breakdown here. And so this one is Huber loss. You see, so initially it's curvy and then it does become like more flat out. Cool. And I also wanted to show you just for fun what the Python code for all these loss functions look like. This is a very cool site called readthedocs.io. This is ML cheat sheet. So we'll leave out things like cross entropy, but uh, for instance, here is Huber loss. See, there's a formula. So for whatever delta you pick, if the actual you know error that you get is lower, then you make it quadratic, so it's for small errors. So, and then for larger ones, you become more linear like that. Then we'll get to pull back later on a little bit. Here's L1, so literally just absolute value. And then here's L2, literally, you know, the, the difference and then squared. All this and, sorry. Okay, so then moving on, more. Um, so then what about probabilistic predictions? So meaning what about predicting probability distributions? So once again, just to remind you, we've looked at taking actions, uh, predicting a label, like picking a la the best label, and then uh, now picking linear regression parameters. But then what about actually given a bunch of distributions, maybe just simply two different 
probability distributions. So which one is better than the other? So how would you pick the best uh, probability distribution for that like this? So that's gonna be an action, okay? So what is the optimal probability distribution? This is, we're not picking a label or we're not picking numbers, like slopes and y-intercepts. So therefore our loss function, it's all about the loss function. It needs to then know what is, um, like, how does a probability distribution, like how does the one that you want to pick vary from with the ideal one? Like how do you penalize that loss? So for that, we need some measure that takes two distributions and then computes like a statistical distance between them or similarity. So you know, well, like, say one distribution is like a, a Gaussian distribution. The other one is like a beta distribution. They look very different. So then that kind of a, a comparison between them should give you a very high, like a loss. On the other hand, so you have two different Gaussians, they vary only in the variance, so they're almost identical. Then the difference between them should almost be zero. It's a very cool loss function called Kale Kullback Leibler divergence that measures exactly that. Given two probability distributions, P of Y and Q of Y, it tells you how similar you know how different they are using this formula right there. And um, okay, so let me ask you a question. Suppose Oh, well, the question is this, is scale divergence, is, is the formula commutative or not? In other words, if you switch P and Q, would you get the same value? Yeah, so why not? Just very briefly, informally, I'm going to scratch. So why is it not commutative? Why does order matter? In reality, the answer would be that it's actually the ratio of likelihoods. So given an actual data in a uh, point from, from your you know, distribution, what you're trying to find out is, does the data point fit better with probability P1 or P2? So it's a, the likelihood of P1 divided by P2, okay, or P divided by Q in that in sense. But you can just look here and answer it very simply, which is there's a division involved. And so then P divided by Q is simply not you know identical to Q divided by P, it's really that simple. So it depends on what is at the top because you're trying to measure the likelihood of this divided by likelihood of that, which is where you cannot swap them, okay. All right, cool. So therefore this is P and then Q. So then P occurs like twice here. Okay, so this is called the Kale um, uh, divergence. And again, you probably know about this. I'm gonna show that to you like that. You can simplify this Kale formula like that, you know, just simply do the log subtraction because it's division right there. And then, you get this, so then here, this one is like a cross term. It's actually um, cross entropy because H is supposed to be the entropy factor. So it's cross entropy because it's P as well as this you know, Q here. And so then this loss in this form, it would be called the cross entropy loss. And the cross entropy loss is all you have to find in order to you know, see if one distribution is better than the other, see if the loss in one case is smaller than the loss in the other case compared to your actual predicted data, then pick the distribution with the least loss. That's cool. And so if you want a slightly better explanation about the whole commutation is right here. So again, divergence P comma Q, and then gives you like an intuition about, in fact, here they drive the whole formula, believe it or not, so it's actually very cool. And then they tell you why you cannot swap P and Q. Just leave that for later like that. Uh, Oops, I'm gonna fix that, sorry about that. Huh. I'll fix it. All right, so then you need to minimize, as always, you know, whenever there's a loss, you're trying to minimize you know, the loss value. And so then you pick the distribution with the least loss. All right, then, so that's in general, but then very specifically, this one is really easy to do and easy to understand. For a specific kind of a probability distribution, and not even probability, just a distribution called one heart encoding. So in one heart encoding, this is what you do. You take this individual, you know, like categories in this case, just words. And then you make each one into a vector because there are three of them, the vector has three bits in this case, except in each one of them, one is one, the others are zero. So this is one and zeros here. There's one the rest of zero here, one rest of zero. So then when you're given a distribution like this, and then you get, you know, data a lot encoded like that. You're trying to fit like a probability distribution. So then the loss for this is very easy to calculate. It looks like this, and just simply like that's all it is, because when um, you when you're looking at not the class, so the class value would be like where the one went, 
with the one going like location number, you know, zero or one or two. It's going to be the class zero or one or two. It's the place where the log actually matters because, you know, that's where the one is. Everywhere else, this is zero. So then those zeros just drop out. And so therefore, it's a very easy little formula that just says for one hot encoding, the predicted probability with the label is the only one that influences the whole loss. All the other properties just go away because they're going to be multiplied by zeros. Cool. Because that delta term gives you zero. It's a Kronecker delta function, right? The delta function is one only like where you only in the column where you have a one, this is one. Otherwise, this delta simply becomes a zero. Okay, so everybody says zero, only one matters. And so that is what one matters. So that's your formula. Okay. So then there's also like a little uh, a detour that the book takes, where they talk about this notion of a proper scoring rule. The proper scoring rule is any kind of a formula, uh, a function, scoring function, where the function returns like a large value when you report your own probability distribution. So once again, this is about taking probability distributions and then scoring them in terms of you know how good they are. So say two distributions, P and Q. So if you're looking for Q and you end up scoring P, you might not get an optimal value. But then if you're looking for Q and you score based on Q itself, you'll get a pretty high value. So then that is called the proper scoring. So rules like that are a pretty, they're called proper scoring rules. So then this cross entropy loss turns out to be a proper scoring rule. Again, exactly because of what we said, where there's only ones in specific columns and then all the other columns are zeros. And so then that's an example of a proper scoring rule. So that is an example of a proper scoring rule right there. Cool. Just this notion of a proper scoring rule the book mentions. And um, so then I have like three more slides actually. So I'll tell you this one. This one is actually one of the easiest to tell you. All right, so in standard scientific circles, a very, 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 very important thing to do is do hypothesis testing. So I discovered a new drug with hypothesis is that drug is effective. You know, I found a better way to get to work. The hypothesis, it works like every single time. You always have a hypothesis that is called the alternate hypothesis. And the hypothesis that's trying to kill it is called the null hypothesis where, oh, come on, there's no difference at all. You just made this up. You know, your drug is not effective, you're just dreaming. Then the idea would be that you wonder if you should reject the null hypothesis, meaning if you should do, if your tests indicate that your so-called alternate hypothesis is a better hypothesis. So normally in a non-Bayesian kind of testing, you establish something called a significance level, like say 95%, it's called the alpha value. So 0 0.05, that was at 95%. In terms of normal distribution curve, there are the two tailed ends of the curve, the two sides of the curve. Then from your data, you compute this p-value. Then you see if the p-value is even more extreme. So meaning if the p-value falls within the 0 0.05 margin on either side. So then compared to your mean, which is in the middle, your extreme value is so extreme that it cannot have happened by chance. And you think, wow, my alternate hypothesis actually works. So I can reject the null and my experiment one, I'm gonna get rich. That's the idea. So they use significance levels and p-values. But very interestingly, you don't need to do that at all. We can actually take two hypotheses called M0 and M1, and then you know choose M0 or M1, meaning reject one or not, by just simply computing these so-called base factors. So specifically, you compute this ratio, this ratio right there. It's all based on likelihoods. So again, I've got some data. Then did the data come from model one or did it come from model zero? So then you evaluate these hypotheses, sorry, these likelihoods and divide them. And so then the definition for this base factor, one comma zero is defined like this. So one means corresponding to you know, hypothesis one and zero could be hypothesis zero. So this could be the null hypothesis, one could be the alternate hypothesis, for example. So then this becomes a simple positive numerical term and based on again, you know, how good your M1 versus M0 are, the values are gonna be like all over the place. So then you come up with this very cool little scale so Jeffrey scale is what it's called. See if this base factor right there is less than one over hundred. That means this denominator is like so large, the numerator is basically insignificant. So you definitely go with M0, meaning you cannot reject the null hypothesis. So your alternate hypothesis failed. On the other hand, if this ratio is only one over 10, less than only one over 10, say it's like 0 0.12 or something, then you still, the denominator is still pretty large. So there's still strong evidence. And then if it is getting like even close to one, then there's moderate evidence. And then now it is still closer and then weak evidence. But now over here it flipped. 
So then from one third to one, now it's going from you know three to one. So now it's increasing, the numerator is increasing. So now you have a value here between one and three. So now M1 is starting to look good. If this ratio, the ratio becomes like between three and 10, M1 is even better. More than 10, M1 is amazing. More than 100, M1 is supremely awesome. So we can just simply use these positive values, these fractions, so sometimes very large values, to decide if you should pick M1 or M2, oh, sorry, M0 or M1. So that is pretty much the whole hypothesis picking, which is exactly, you know, like I said, in scientific circles, it's a very big deal. But we can now do this using these base factors. So then the book goes through this very interesting application of doing this base factor, but except the bottom just simply becomes a constant and drops out. So it's all about just the top value. Okay? So here they take a coin and they toss the coin like five times. And then you're supposed to decide, is the coin a fair coin or is it some kind of a biased coin? So then, you know, I'll let you work through all of this. This is the reason why the bottom is just simply a constant. And then it's like five and it's like half raised to five. But then the top, they use actually the beta binomial distribution to estimate, you know, the likelihood of uh, any number of heads, any number of tails in a row, for instance. Here we're doing like heads in a row, two heads in a row, three heads, four heads, five heads. And then if you wonder what B is, B is something called the beta function, not to be confused with the beta distribution, which is written B-E-T-A. So these are all in other parts of the book or in other books as well. All right, so then if you compute this P, then what happens if you actually plot that? So then you plot log of the, the P value that you compute of just the numerator, denominator doesn't matter. And you get a very interesting distribution like this. So then from here, what this says is the probability of getting you know two heads or you know three heads in a row would be quite high if you have a fair coin. You know this not to be um, dismissed. Then you think, wow, it's also true if you have a biased coin. But there's an Occam's razor principle that says if you can pick the simpler alternative, pick it. Therefore, we'll go with the M0 simple alternative that is actually a fair coin. But on the other hand, if you have five heads in a row or four heads in a row then there's something wrong. It's probably like heavily biased, like weighted towards heads. And so then you would go with the alternate hypothesis, which is M1, which is my coin is biased. So therefore you'll be able to use the little curve to tell. So if the value is pretty low for the ratio, then you pick, because again, that, that is log of the base factor. Then you pick M0, if the ratio starts to get high, then you pick M1, exactly like, you know, what I said here, okay. All right, so then that, and so this one is the whole, you know, this actually is two sections from there. So I just oh, crossed it up. In other words, BIC is right here. It's actually here, Bayesian information criteria. So since we didn't get to that, I just crossed it out. Um, can I go on for five more minutes, Peter? How long do I have? I had not given this talk before, obviously, so I had no idea how long it was going to take. So can I go for five more minutes or not? Oh, cool. OK. Good, so I only have three more slides. Okay, so going back to our table of contents then, we're using the Bayes idea for selecting and doing all kinds of things. At first it was action, then labels, and then the regression values, and then probability curves, hypothesis. Now what about entire models? Meaning, what about one regression value versus another regression value? Meaning, say you have multiple models, they all have different coefficients, then which, which is going to best fit your data? That is called model selection. As opposed to here, within a single model, uh, where's that? This, yeah. See here, within a single model, you're wondering what the parameters are. Oh, cool, 90 minutes, thank you. But then in here, you're actually doing entire models versus each other, okay? All right, that's called model selection, the process. For that, this is what we do. You calculate posteriors for a whole set of models. So once again, you've got some data and then you have many alternate models. Some are maybe linear regression, some are parabolic regression, some are degree three, degree four, all different kinds of models with different coefficients. You calculate the posterior value as if all those models could have um, produced the data. And then you evaluate the loss for each one of those. And then you pick the best model that has the least loss or the model with the highest value opposite of loss. Again, as you know, there's lots of you know posterior values arg max, or if you take the negative log of that, then it's going to be the arg min. One is just simply the complement of the other. All right, so you got this data, and then like I said, a whole bunch of models, and then evaluate them all, the likelihood, and then pick the the best model, the highest value. All right, so then that is done like here. So then 
for that you have to evaluate this thing called the marginal likelihood, right? Because you have many different models. Um, and then um, you want to find the evidence, you know, for the model. Data over all the parameter values. So the priors are all priors over parameters. So again, because it is marginal, you need to multiply by the prior probability, you know, times the likelihood for each one of those. Okay, so then if for a particular model, um, all of the highest data is aligned so that you get the high probability for a specific model, then that model is gonna win. Cool. So then to illustrate that the book does something interesting, they pick a curve, and the curve is actually formalized in green, some kind of parabolic curve. At first, they only calculate five data points off of the curve, and then they add a little bit noise to it, I think. So then they fit like linear regression value, and then a parabolic value, degree two, and also they fit a cubic value. And then they calculate the likelihood of which is gonna be the best of all of those three. And this is very interesting. So likelihood for degree one, which is that one, likelihood, likelihood. So you incorrectly end up thinking for these five pieces of data, or maybe not, maybe correctly, that the regression that approximates the data is linear. Because from this little limited data that we have, that's exactly what it looks like. I have like five you know, things that almost look linear, so my red line. Whereas the parabola starts to diverge and plus you get like a large error for those. And the cube, it's a little bit weird. Okay, so then, but that we picked the wrong value, picked the wrong model that is, we picked the linear model because there's only five points. So what if you actually calculate 30 points? Then that looks truly like a parabolic distribution. That's very cool. Then you do exactly the same thing. You calculate the, uh, posteriors for degree one, for degree two, and degree three, and you plot them here. So degree one, degree two, much, much better than either one of those. Degree three, then you end up picking degree two, which is exactly the right value that you want. So then that is the illustration of what model would you pick. In this case, the models happen to be a mixture of linear and you know, nonlinear. But even within nonlinear, maybe you can even have different models that have different, like say this is AX squared plus BX plus C or something. You can have different combinations of ABC values. And then you could do likelihoods for all of them and pick the very best one that passes through your data. Once again, it's all about basically classic curve fitting. Okay, like in other words, regression fitting. But now we can use base for that because of likelihood. Cool, so that's the model selection example. Next. Almost to the end. Um, it's a very interesting principle that is mentioned. And this principle is a general, is, I guess it's a Bayesian version of a general philosophical idea called Occam's razor, where informally you would say, if there's something happening and you have two different explanations for you know what, what caused it, one is a very simple, straightforward explanation, the other one is extremely complicated. So then logic says, you know, you should pick the simpler one, you know. Like, why not, right? Because you have less explaining to do if you do that. So likewise, in here, this whole Bayesian Occam's razor principle. And the principle, you know, does get mathematical here, and I have a very simple example from the book. But just to tell you, like, what that is, when you have models M1 and M2, then suppose they both, you know, give you, like, pretty high values for posterior, then you still wonder, why well, which one should I pick? Because they both look pretty good. And the idea is you would pick M1 based on its simplicity. So that is that becomes a deciding factor. Then that's called the Occam's razor principle. But then what if you have three different models, like M1, M2, and M3? And so M1 is a simple model. It probably doesn't have too many parameters. And then M2 is of medium complexity. M3 is a pretty complex model. So and then they all produce like high, relatively high posterior. So which one would you pick? You can actually plot them in turns out. So then here's the data against which all those models are evaluated. So D0 is the actual observed data, then you draw a line through like D0, and here are the models. So then what does the model do uh, for that value of D0? What probability does it assign that the D0 came from the model? So M1 assigns a very low probability, the probability is over here. M3, because it's very complex, also assigns a low probability, because M3 assigns a low probability for all kinds of data. M2, on the other hand, assigns the higher probability, you now in this red dot, for that exact same data. So of the three, M1, M2, and M3, like Goldilocks, we end up picking M2 because it has the complexity of the right size that lets us pick that because it produces the highest uh, probability value for the data having come from that model. So you pick M2, okay, like right there. Cool. So that's an example of an Occam's razor principle. The very last one is really more like a formula because I'm leaving out the derivation. 
So we have this notion of an information criteria. So once again, these are just simply ways to evaluate models. So you have models, and then you know which model should you pick. It's always the same question over and over, like what best fits my data. So then one way is to not even calculate actual likelihood, because when you do marginal likelihood, because it's marginal, you also need the prior probabilities, like for all the different you know, distributions. So maybe we don't always have access to those. So therefore, rather than do full marginal likelihood, which is called evidence, instead you can use a much simpler formula, just a likelihood formula uh, to select the optimal model. So then those kinds of formulae that are called information criteria, right? The marginal likelihood is needed. So instead you can just compute like information criteria. Like they're basically boiled down to very easy formula that you can get from your data that you can evaluate from your data. There's three of them. One is a Bayesian information criterion. In fact, historically, the first one was actually a Kai key, and then Bayesian came afterwards. And then the more recent one is called MDL. All of them have a very similar form, you notice. They all have a negative log term, and then they all have like a penalty term, like a regularization kind of term. And then they're both like loss functions, you want to minimize them. So I'll just go you know, in the order that the book produces it. First one is the Bayesian information criterion, BIC. So then it's defined like this, you know, then the HESC and you know, like all of that. A lot of times what I do is ignore the math and just go for like what it does and afterwards go back and fill in the blanks. So right now I'll do that in the interest of time now, like this. So the big loss, so the Bayesian, you know, uh, information criteria loss, is just very simply this formula right there. So it is negative two times log of this uh, prior, sorry, like this, this likelihood right there. And then plus this is DMS, like how many terms are in your model? And then N is how many data points you have, this size of your data set. Very interestingly, AIC looks almost identical. So this first term is very similar. But then what is different is there's an extra factor of two, that's okay. But then this D, they should also say DM, I think it's a little typo. But then what is missing is the log N term. That's the only difference between A and R, uh, K and PIC. Cool. And uh, MDL is a little bit different. MDL comes from like information theory, but a very similar format where you estimate the number of bits in this case, okay? So like this, so CM is negative log PM bits. So this one is probably like the least useful of all of them. But then the idea is to just point it out. They look a lot like AIC, BIC. See, in reality, people would pick like AIC or BIC and evaluate these losses for different models and then pick the model that has the least loss. And you wouldn't need to do whole hog and actually do the um, evidence estimation for the models. Because like I said, you might not have the priors for the models for all the parameters. You go for this less simpler route. And this article goes through a little bit more detail, but first of all, the intuition, and then some of the actual formula right there. So all this. Okay, so then here, you know, it tells you, you know, how many different ways to do the model fitting anyway. This is the classic machine learning data science approach. You can also do resampling. But then these are the more of the ones we looked at during this, this lecture right now, more like prob probabilistic statistics. Like how do you do estimations using all these formulae, you know, KL, divergence, all that, and then pick the best model. Okay, so then you need to evaluate models always in terms of performance, of course, and also their complexity. And, uh, Okay, so Emily, Akaiki, so Akaiki looks like this, and then Bayesian looks like that. So they both have this, you know, LL, right? Log like you heard. Cool. And then there's also MDL for what it's worth. It doesn't say much about MDL. Okay. And then they actually give you an example of a linear regression. What else can I do? And, ooh. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the topics we looked at, they're all right here, the table of contents, but they're also here. Oops. We first started by looking at what independent events are. So if everything in the world was independent, <laughs> you would need like almost none of these, okay? Laws just go away really, but then things are conditioned, it turns out, you know? And so then the rest like base basically shows up and helps us out. So we looked at the basics of the whole base theorem. And then we started using the whole base idea of things like marginal likelihood, no, or just standard log likelihood for, um, you know, doing like all these different things. For instance, you know, what action to perform. So then you translate your beliefs, which is your probability of having COVID or not into actually like, you know, do you have to give drug to this person or not? Because cost is involved. So then you pick the, you know, the, the least 
uh, damaging option, meaning if the cost becomes more, you know, than the cost of doing nothing, then you have to, you have to actually act. Then um, classification. So here's where you pick levels, and then ROC curves, and then PR curves. So again, ways to evaluate like model uh, fidelity. And then regression parameters. How do you pick regression value? The best regression values. How do you pick the best probability distribution? How do you pick the best hypothesis? That's the base factors. And then how do you do model selection? And finally, use the Occam's razor principle to pick the, the model with optimum complexity to go with that. And then also the two information criteria formula can also be used to evaluate models in the absence of full-blown evidence calculation. So that is all under choosing the right model. In our book, this is like section 5.1, and I believe it's section 5.2. I left out the others because they're more frequentist. And so then the hypothesis evidence formula that I showed you, you know, it's like from here, I just made that. Base, by the way, was also a, like a, a reverend, was a, you know, priest. And then he did not publish the, the base theorem himself. He actually had a diary where he wrote down all his formulae, just and many other discoveries have made. And he had someone nominated in his will. And he said, after I die, I want this person to go through my stuff and publish all my findings. And thankfully, that person was smart enough to discover the base theorem. That's a very interesting little trivia. Cool. And now look at this. You can go to bit.ly slash PML underscore chapter five. That takes you to my bytes.usc radio area and what we went through. Okay, so space bar is how you can go through all of the slides. It's full, hmm. like a link, circular link list. You can also use arrow keys, forward arrow keys, and also backward arrow keys, a doubly linked circular list. Cool. And you can press the letter A, A stands for all. So all makes the entire thing into one big page. If you want to scroll through like this really fast, it's all actually one page. A is a toggle, so A will also go back to a slide mode. On your phone, you can use this to toggle. See again, toggle between all mode, slide mode, all mode, slide mode. Or on a phone, you can touch this, or you can touch this. Additionally, one last thing. If you press the letter C, C stands for table of contents. C, then you can nonlinear just jump around wherever you want. C. All right. So that is how you navigate through all of this. And if you are curious, <laughs> thank you. I made this all you know, using just very simple HTML. And this is a very neat slidey.js function. That is the one that takes all these divs. Ultimately, they're just divs. The divs all get broken up into slides, actually, so you can make free format slides. I use this a lot because within a so-called slide, I'm able to actually put links and scrollable stuff. Okay, so then one last thing to tell you was, I, this is me. So please feel free to send me an email, be in touch, LinkedIn, Facebook as well. And uh, as they say, that's all folks. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Sati. That was awesome. Cool, thank you, Pierre. Yes, I have one, um, one quick question for you regarding the slides. Um, is there any chance that you can convert them to a PDF document? Absolutely. So just to show you, right? So I'll do it for sure and I'll put it up. But like this, if you go to A, the letter A, and then you can actually print it. And then if you are in the landscape mode, then it'll actually show you one per page. So save as oh, PDF. Save PDF. PDF. Okay, great. great. <laughs> so there it is. So you can yeah. just go in like all mode and print it, okay? okay. Um, so I have a question also about the material. Um, when I first looked at this chapter, um, I was really um, surprised by the content. It's not what I was expecting. Um, when I think of decision theory, I think of things like um, Markov decision processes and, and stuff. And in the very first page, he talked about um, agents and policies. And I got really excited because I thought he was going to go into some you know, RL type stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But um, most of the um, of, of the chapter was really on this kind of idea of model selection and stuff. I agree with that. Yeah, I think he's saving all that for the second book. You know, it seems to me like the book, the next book, the so-called book two, 
is mm -hmm. pretty heavy on things like reinforcement learning. So maybe all that material is saved for the future, is really what I can guess. There's also partially observed, you know, like Markov decision process. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you know, things you can do with probability trees and so forth. So I have a yeah. feeling that it'll all be in book two. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Satish since we uh, have him here? You can unmute, by the way. <laughs> and by the way, um, those uh, paintings you're seeing are all, all done by uh, Satish. He's not only a computer science person, he's also an artist and a, a very good artist, oh, I might add. Well, thank you. Well, you're very sweet. You actually put it up on your page and you have nice captions and uh, sayings and philosophical quotes to go with them. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. He, the only issue I have with him is that Sati doesn't name his painting. So I, I always have to come up with a name for the painting. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I, I like I like labeled data. <laughs> yes, I like that. It's a good skill to have. All right. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Once again, thank you very much, Sati. You did a great job. And thank you for putting the time in to prepare this. I know you're, you're busy. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining. And we will meet here next week to co cover uh, information theory, I think, is the next chapter. Sounds good. Thanks for the chance, Pierre. Take care, everybody. OK, take care. Have a good night, everybody, or, or good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.